Welcome to the February 21st edition of This Week in South Carolina In Session. I'm Gavin Jackson here at the State House in Columbia. Well, it was a long Wednesday here at the State House, specifically in the Senate, which met for several hours today and even uh, had to reschedule one meeting after adjournment due to long debate over a bill dealing with poultry farms. Now, not too many details on that since lawmakers are still talking about that, but that, that meeting that was postponed had to deal with two gun reform bills that we had talked about yesterday, but it has been moved to Thursday morning. Also, another meeting after adjournment was dealing with several nuclear utility reform bills. That Senate meeting did take place. Uh, the senators there did receive some information. Uh, no real action taken. Again, they just heard from the um, Office of Regulatory Staff about several bills that are before them right now. But we did go to one House subcommittee meeting today where lawmakers did take a bill that would prohibit call spoofing. Some more details on that in a minute. Also, we did talk to one lawmaker in the House about a bill that he wants to see move forward dealing with the AR-15 rifle. So a lot of moving parts up here in the State House. So let's get right into it right now. H4628 would increase fines against telemarketers who call a person using a spoof number that sometimes mimics the first six digits of a person's phone number. The amended bill will increase the fine to a maximum of $5,000. The bill, if it becomes law, would let the state work closer with the feds to crack down on spoofing and prevent it. When that happens, who's going to track it? So the federal, our federal counterparts have been able to do so. And it, oftentimes it's an IT related issue um, because the technology that's being used to spoof is connected to a computer. Yes. Uh, so there's some high tech ways that I myself am not 100% aware of that there is a capability for. Uh, my, going forward if this were to, to go into, into law, then my job would be to contact our federal counterparts to figure out how they do it and to figure out if it would be a standalone effort of our department or if we would join forces like we do in several of our enforcement actions, especially that are of an interstate or international sometimes issue, uh, that we would partner up with our federal counterparts to be able to enforce the, the law or to stop them. And then there's enforcement provisions in there. The current law has it at $100. For a violation and two hundred dollars for a violation we saw ranges from about a thousand to ten thousand dollars i think florida was the ten thousand dollar they're really active in the telemarketing area as they should be because a lot of the bad guys are in florida unfortunately they're they're not too far from us uh, so i think we put in there a maximum of up to five thousand dollars per violation just kind of uh, splitting it in the middle and hopefully giving some incentive for folks to to not violate the law and I did catch up with Administrator Leibarker after the meeting. She told me that more people in South Carolina need to sign up for the Do Not Call Registry. That will help cut back on these spoof calls and also give them some ammunition and a case when they present it to the South Carolina Department of Consumer Affairs going forward. Now switching from telemarketing problems to gun problems, we caught up with House Minority Leader Todd Rutherford, who's a Democrat from Columbia, to talk about his proposed bill that he introduced today that would restrict the age of a person who could buy an AR-15. That's an assault style uh, rifle that has been used in several school shootings and other mass shootings in the country. Let's talk to Representative Rutherford about the details of this bill. I think anybody that has watched the news lately understands the motivation that this body has to do something. We can't simply sit around and ignore the fact that children, again, were killed. That teachers, somebody trying to do their job, were killed at the hands of someone carrying an assault weapon, that weapon being an AR-15. AR AR-15 seemed to be the preferred weapon of choice for school shooters, for mass shooters, and we need to do something. We need to narrowly tailor a solution, and that solution is the bill that I proposed today, that I dropped today, which would stop anyone in high school, high school age, from being able to buy an AR-15. And we narrowly tailored it to make it 20 years old, not 21, believing that 21 is an artificial age, 20 because that is an age at which everyone should be out of high school. So it's 20 years old, up to that age, you cannot buy an AR-15. And that's a simply put bill that I think will do it go a long way to stopping the purchase and the use of AR-15s in school shootings. I think that people are right. I think that you're not going to stop unless you ban and outlaw every single gun in this country, you're not going to stop gun violence. But we can make a difference. We can, we can show that in the past school shootings, people obtain these guns legally, that they are AR-15s and they're there for a purpose. You don't have to aim that well, you just keep shooting. They carry large clips, and so that's why people use them. Can they go to other guns? Other guns are simply not as accurate. Could they use a pistol? Simply not as accurate, especially at long range. So this was, I believe, a well-thought-out bill to go after a specific person, and that person who's going and buying an AR-15 in order to shoot up a school, we've got to stop it. 
Now, House lawmakers did have a subcommittee meeting today on several opioid-related bills. However, they didn't make much movement on those bills, including one that would make naloxone, which is that uh, opioid antidote drug, more available. However, House lawmakers did move one bill, H3820, forward on the House floor today, and we'll send it to the Senate later this week. And that bill actually uh, codifies an education requirement that was passed last year by the, by the General Assembly which would require uh, students in high school to receive about four hours of opioid abuse prevention uh, education uh, through their high school years. So kind of a big bill, uh, a lot of broad, broad bipartisan support on that bill. Uh, let's go to the House floor to hear some more details about that bill. The K-12 subcommittee did amend the bill requiring the State Board of Education to include instruction on prescription opioid abuse prevention with the emphasis on prescription drug epidemic and the connection between the opioid abuse and the addiction to other drugs. The board must make available to districts a list of instructional material that meet state standards, but districts shall continue to adopt or develop curriculum locally. And yes, S-107, the governor, lieutenant governor joint ticket bill is still being talked about here in the state house, even though we haven't seen much committee action, conference committee action on that bill. A lot of talk, a lot of separate bills being introduced over the past weeks dealing with that bill. One such was introduced today by Representative Merle Smith, who is a conferee, is a house conferee on that conference committee. And he stood at the well with his fellow conferees House Majority Leader Gary Simrel and House Minority Leader Todd Rutherford to introduce this bill that would kind of take care of uh, the primary mechanics of electing and fundraising for the governor, lieutenant governor running on a joint ticket. Now you might remember we've talked about this, it was 2012 constitutional amendment to let the governor and lieutenant governor run on the same ticket in 2018. It's 2018, we still have a few mechanics to work out on this bill. Uh, but Representative Smith said that the State Election Commission told him that this is not too much of a concern since the constitutional amendment kind of takes care of itself. But to be safe and be on the side of safety, they're pushing through a separate bill from S-107 that they introduced today and skip the committee process with that would just deal with the election and uh, fundraising portion of the governor and lieutenant governor running on the same ticket. This gets rid of the whole judicial constitutional officer pay study situation that has bogged down S-107. So let's hear some more from uh, Representative Smith right now. And so, ladies and gentlemen, where we are with this bill is you hear of them. We, there was a joint resolution that was offered not too long ago over in the Senate, and I heard clouds were a-brewing over in, the, in this legislature, and we were going to have to put off the primary election. Well, lo and behold, we called the election commission and asked about that, and they said they knew nothing about that 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 was just more rhetoric that was coming from the Senate and empty rhetoric at that. And so where we are is if there is a problem and these guys do not want to address something that has, that has been there and they think it's okay for the education superintendent to continue to make $92,500 when superintendents make double that across the state, or if they think it's okay for the attorney general to make $92,500 when solicitors who he oversees makes $140,000, then that's fine. We won't study the issue. We'll just continue to kick that can down the road. But what we will do is we will fix the issue with this bill, and that's what we're doing here today, is fixing solely the election issue, putting guidance to, this, uh, to the uh, election commission on how this should run, allowing the campaign contributions at the request of them to be combined, $3,500 per ticket, and that's all we're doing. What is in the bill now was to take the appointments that were given to the Lieutenant Governor and give them to the President pro tempore of the Senate. So acquire and consolidate more power in the Senate instead of taking it, leaving it with the Lieutenant Governor. That will not be part of this bill. This study committee will not be part of the bill. We will fix the election problem if that's what they need. The Election Commission and the Attorney General has told us that this is self-executing. If we pass it, then it's great, but if we don't pass it, the election will go forward. But out of an abundance of caution, this is what we're doing is passing this, is introducing this bill where we can have fix any concern about how the election is going to ha happen. It will happen before filing, so we ask for it to go without reference so we can go ahead and pass it this week and send it over to the Senate, and let's see how serious they are about fixing this problem. 
And like I said, a Senate subcommittee meeting did take place after the Senate adjourned this evening. Uh, it was, again, pretty much informational. They didn't go into too many specifics on the several bills in front of them. They did receive uh, good information from the Office of Regulatory Staff, which oversees uh, utility regulation in the state. So we still are awaiting some movement on that. Again, House members have been really pounding senators on what they see as a perceived dragging of the feed over in the Senate. Obviously, senators say that they're meeting still. They're a very deliberative body. But uh, House members really have to see action, uh, action taking place a lot quicker. We've seen a lot of harsh comments coming from the Senate, uh, from the House, excuse me. And uh, senators still taking their time, despite some of them wanting to move faster on some of these bills. So again, keep an eye out for those. That's really um, what is dominating this session so far. And look forward to some more activity tomorrow. We're going to see that gun reform hearing on those two bills, one that would expedite background check information reporting to background check databases in the country, uh, and another one that would make it a crime to threaten gun violence in school. So a lot happening tomorrow, too. Again, House Ways and Means is also meeting, doing del uh, budget deliberations this week as well. So stick with SCE TV throughout the 2018 legislative session as we give you daily video recaps every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, live at 7 p.m. on SCE TV's Facebook page, our YouTube page, and my Twitter account, at Gavin Jackson. But we don't stop there. Make sure you go to SCETV.org every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday again to find out what's going on up here at the State House by looking at the State House Daybook. Now that gives you the agendas, that gives you schedules, that gives you the top state political news, and you can find my video recaps there as well. And if you like podcasts, which you really should because this is a good one, listen to the South Carolina Lead every Tuesday when we talk to newsmakers and those who cover the newsmakers about recent developments in the news and what's going on up here at the State House. For SCETV, I'm Gavin Jackson here in Columbia.